Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to join Ranking Member Collins in saying it's very gracious and very generous of you to permit others to take on the questioning first and to say I feel much safer asking my questions knowing you'll be in the cleanup position there at the end for what we leave out. But I, I wanted to ask a question around the, the great public debate that's going on about entitlement reform and that we keep hearing the warning that we must make substantial changes to Medicare or face bankruptcy of the Medicare system. And yet I'm reminded that in 2010, we passed substantial Medicare reform. We didn't give it that name, but we passed the Affordable Care Act. And it resulted in powerful changes, both in how we deliver medical care, how we bill for medical care, and indeed research on medical care. And we note now that in 2012, that the increase in medical spending uh, for Medicare is now the slowest it's been in 15 years, that the Congressional Budget Office has revised its estimates, as the chairman noted earlier, uh, in just two years has revised its estimates for spending over the next 10 years, saying it's going to be about 15 percent less than originally estimated, and that that's a savings well in excess of $100 billion. So we're in a system that's substantially changing. So I want to frame my question this way. I invite you to talk about how the Affordable Care Act changes the delivery of health care, any part of it, to reduce costs and what paths, what opportunities it shows us for making changes in costs in the future. And I know that you've really addressed that, Dr. Goodman, in part when you talk about your hospital readmission study. You, you did it specifically. Dr. Blumenthal, I think you were hitting at it a little bit indirectly. So maybe if I just start with you on that question. Uh, thank you, Senator Warren. Um, you're absolutely right. The, the Affordable Care Act was really two pieces of legislation, one that extended coverage to many uninsured Americans, another that attempted to uh, initiate very important reforms in the delivery of, our, of health care. Uh, it is true that we're seeing uh, slowdowns in the overall cost of care, the rate of increase in the overall cost of care and in Medicare. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little premature to declare a victory. Fair enough. Uh, we have seen repeated cycles of uh, rapid increase and then slowdown in health care costs uh, over the last 20 to 30 years, and they often coincide with insurance cycles rather than fundamental change in health care. Nevertheless, the uh, Affordable Care Act does provide uh, fundamental new tools. Uh, one of them uh, is, uh, among them are the uh, penalties for readmission, the penalties for uh, hospital-acquired infections that are out of above average, uh, pay-for-value programs, uh, and programs that have been initiated uh, through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which includes the Pioneer ACO program, a version of the Affordable Care Act, and so on. What I think we need most at this point is to bring all those different threads together in a comprehensive and synergistic program of health care reform. Uh, the Secretary has new authority to do that, but uh, each of these initiatives is currently being implemented in a, a very uh, particular way on its own uh, basis and without bringing them together in a comprehensive uh, approach. And that's really what our Commonwealth Commission was about taking these authorities, taking these ideas, and saying, let's put them together in a comprehensive package, let's cost them out, and let's see what we can get if we really push them to their full advantage. And, and because I take this, this uh, suggestion very seriously, just make sure I'm following all the way through. This is something that's within the capacity of our current structure. It's just a, an opportunity we have not yet seized. Is that right? It does not require new legislation, for example? I think it would require some changes in legislation. Uh, uh, the kinds of reforms that we're proposing would require some changes in legislation. Just as an example, changing the SGR formula, which is now quite toxic, uh, and the fee-for-service approach to Medicare payment. Uh, at, though it's moving toward pay-for-value, it's doing it in a very kind of uh, staccato, short, uh, uh, incremental way. We can't afford to wait until all these different programs have been allowed to uh, continue to prove themselves. Uh, they need to be 
knit together and pushed home to prevent us from rationing away critical benefits. Thank you. I, I'm going to be mindful of my time because I'm now out of time, but I'm, I will put this in the questions for the record to everyone and ask for more details on that one as well. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. Senator Warren. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to give an opportunity to Dr. Kabansky, Dr. Goodman, and Dr. Thorpe if they wanted to comment on the question I had earlier about how the Affordable Care Act changes have reduced costs and show paths for future savings that we should note. And I just want to give you a chance to do that on the record here. Dr. Kavinsky. Thank you, Senator Warren. Um, I would echo uh, Dr. Blumenthal's remark that <clears throat> it is still a bit of a mystery about why cost growth has slowed. But of course, it is a promising early indicator um, since in the past three years now, we've seen Medicare cost growth at a really historically slow uh, rate. Um, I would um, suggest that um, one of the important um, provisions of, in the Affordable Care Act is the creation of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, mm -hmm. which has um, authority to test, um, implement, and expand some of these delivery system reform ideas that we may have seen in the private sector but haven't really seen in Medicare and certainly not in the traditional Medicare program. I think that's where since, you know, 75 percent of the Medicare population is currently in the traditional Medicare system today, that's really where we have, I think, a lot of opportunity to um, achieve a lot more savings moving, moving forward. Um, and I know that um, the Center for Medicare and Medi Medicaid Innovation is, is rolling out very quickly a lot of these ideas, the um, accountable care organizations, bundled payments, medical homes. So it's really testing a lot of ideas and those that do show promise for, uh, for reducing costs and either increasing quality or not, uh, not reducing quality can be expanded. Um, the um, HHS secretary has the authority to do that without needing to go back to Congress for, um, for legislative authority. So I think that's a positive step. Thank you. Very, very valuable. Thank you. Dr. Thor uh, Dr. Goodman? Yes, uh, again, very quickly, I mean, I, I think it's uh, been a remarkable revolution in that we've gone from being the country that did the very best job of measuring and studying healthcare of any country in the world to now a country that is engaged in tremendous innovation. Um, and the, 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 and the question, of course, is the sum total of that innovation, particularly if it's separate pieces of innovation, will they knit together to actually, aside from improving quality in parts, will it improve quality as a whole and efficiency as a whole? particularly if capacity is fixed and healthcare systems have this legacy of, of what they've been doing for 50 years. Um, and on this point, um, we don't know. We don't know, for example, where the accountable care organizations will, will, will deliver on their hope and promise. I, I certainly hope they do. Um, it is unknown. It is very, still very worrisome. I am not comforted either by the recent slowdown in, in the growth of of, uh, of uh, expenditures. We saw that before in the 1980s. That was one of the effects of the Clinton health care reform plan that wasn't passed. We actually saw a slowing down of health care expenditures for a period of time and then a rapid acceleration. So we're not out of the woods yet, and it may indeed require more congressional action to, to pull us along. Thank you. Dr. Thorpe? Well, I certainly think the act moved this in the right direction. Uh, it, it brings in uh, really sort of limited, in, in, in some cases, pilots on payment reforms that I think are moving in the right direction. It uh, provided funding for prevention and public health fund, moving us in the right direction. It has uh, the Innovation Center, uh, which is testing and trying out uh, a variety of new models. I, I think that my suggestion was to really take a two-part strategy, because I'm just concerned with the remaining, I don't know if it's mentality or, or focus, that somehow we're a pilot project away from a miracle. We're not. I mean, we, we need to t act on what we know already that works, and we have an enormous amount of experience with randomized trials in the Medicare population that shows uh, the components of care coordination that are effective. Uh, Medicaid programs are doing this. The private sector is doing, uh, doing this as well. Uh, we can scale and replicate best practice, things that we already know that work, and we just need to implement them. So we need to do a two-part strategy. We need to implement what we know that works and do it program-wide. 
but do it in a way that we're getting feedback and constantly improving it, as Senator Whitehouse talked about. That feedback loop is critical, and we need to learn from our experiences. And we need to continue to do targeted pilots uh, in areas where we need selected new information. But I think we need to make that transition. We don't have a decade to wait to find out from uh, what's coming out of these pilot projects. Uh, as Senator Whitehouse mentioned, unless we give the Congress more tools to generate cost savings, we're going to be in a persistent uh, state of getting savings in Medicare and Medicaid over the next decade of cutting benefits, cutting provider payments, cutting payments to health plans, shifting costs to states and to seniors, none of which solve anything with respect to the long-term cost of the program. They're simply a budget exercise. So I think until we switch this mentality of having the budget drive health policy to one where we have health policy driving the budget outcomes, that's the transition we need to make. Thank you. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. It's a, an extraordinary panel, and I'm delighted to have the chance to get you all on the record on this. Thank you.